we see a daon on the construction. And others riding at anchor in a small harbor on the Arabian Peninsula. It was in boats like these that merchants and fishermen from Islamic countries spread the message of Allah and his prophet Muhammad to distant shores and the myriad of islands that dot the Indian Ocean. And so it was that voyage after voyage, century after century, large and small sailing craft from the Arab world made landfalls in the islands of southern Asia. Slowly, the coastal peoples of the Indian Ocean were converted to Islam and became fervent Muslims, forsaking, out of devotion or fear of reprisals, their own religious and social traditions. They were now followers of the new belief that came from the sea. It was an immense osmosis. So great that today the inhabitants of the main cities of India, Malaysia, and Indonesia are almost entirely Muslim. Hundreds of millions of people whose common reference point is the mosque, of which there are more and more, some rich and imposing, some poor and humble, the hub of a scattering of villages. are the only community centers available to people living on the sea in small remote settlements virtually cut off from the outside world. Fishing villages with roots in the distant past, like this one in the Sulu archipelago east of Borneo. Here, daily life is regulated by rules laid down in that severe, implacable holy book, the Koran, imported from a world that lies far beyond the horizon. On one or two islands, this general and often imposed conversion to Islam was refused outright by tribes who remained faithful to their own strong religious beliefs. Among those who defied the Muslim missionaries were the people of Bali, an act of great courage, and the inhabitants of another Indonesian land, Sulawesi, home of the Toraja, a proud, courageous people to whom we dedicate this film. we should pay homage to the strength that allowed those few Indonesian communities to withstand the onslaught of Islam. Strength born of ardent belief in their own religion, Hinduism. The center of Hinduism in the Far East is the island of Bali. Here, the whole population believes fervently in the basic tenet of their faith, the certainty of reincarnation. The belief that everyone comes back, be it in the guise of another creature, after death and after cremation. 
absolute conviction in the existence of an afterlife inhabited by benevolent beings such as the ones portrayed in these elaborate paper and bamboo statues means that on Bali, death has no sting. Every member of the local population is sure he'll come back to life thanks to the help of these mythical creatures. It is no wonder then that on Bali, collective cremation is cause not only for reverence but also for joyful celebration, during which each family entrusts to its own mythical animal the bodies of its loved ones. Gaily decorated funeral carts gather at a chosen spot in the middle of the island. Lavish events like this are highly expensive, which is why the cremation ceremony is only held every five or six years. This gives families time to save the money that will be needed to pay the local painters and craftsmen commissioned to design and make the canopies, sculptures, baskets for gifts, and all the rest of the paraphernalia that the dead will take with them on their fiery journey toward a new life. The dead will undertake their journey only when every guardian animal is ready to receive them and lead them into the life to come. buried temporarily, waiting months, in some cases years, for the sacred moment. Now, wrapped in white sarongs, they are finally entrusted to their magical protectors with whom they will be burned. Many families have not been able to afford a sufficiently rich catafalque of their own. And then, the body of a sacred animal may contain several deceased members of different families. Naturally, the cost of the giant structure is shared among the families who use it. Together with the sacred animals and the bodies, the flames consume an array of gifts designed to delight the deceased when, in a short time from now, they will be reborn. In general, these gifts are perfumes, balsamic oils, and water from springs that are believed to be the home of nature's guardian deities. At last, the fiery moment arrives. In an instant, the flames consume years and years of waiting and preparation. have given to their dead loved ones. Coins which now become a gift from the dead to the living. The price of the journey from one life to the next. To 
an outsider, the ceremony might seem little more than a short-lived picturesque spectacle. But in reality, the significance of these flames is much deeper. They are the symbol of a faith which gave this peaceful, defenseless people the strength to repulse all foreign intervention and to refuse conversion to other religions, such as Islam and Christianity, even though missionaries of both creeds arrived in forts and often resorted to the use of arms. On Bali, the islanders are faithful to a belief in which death does not bring suffering and despair, but rather joy and renewed faith. These flames are not a horrifying, destructive force. Because even though they are consuming a body forever, they are transporting the spirit of the deceased toward reincarnation in a new life. On other islands in the great archipelagos of the Indian Ocean, rejection of Islam was manifested in a different way. This stretch of land that seems to be suspended between the clouds and the sea is the island of Sulawesi. The teachings of Mohammed and his Koran were brought here about 800 years ago by the first Islamic merchant missionaries. <laughs> When they tried to teach the local population to pray facing toward a distant, unknown place called Mecca, the Toraja, the people of these shores, refused. They had their own prayers and did not intend to renounce them. There were few converts, and the majority preferred to retreat into exile. The mosques that served those who accepted conversion have long since fallen into disrepair, and their ruins are now swallowed up by the jungle that reaches, luxuriantly rich, almost as far as the shoreline. That same jungle into which the Toraja disappeared. When the pressure and oppression of Islam became insupportable, the Toraja abandoned their villages and the sea and migrated toward the interior, not stopping until they reached the mountains that had previously been no more than a distant presence on the horizon. It was up there, in voluntary exile, that they created a new homeland, far away from anybody else, and changed from fishermen to farmers. result was huts that looked like overturned hulls. Fleets of high-proud craft riding immobile at anchor in inland village harbors. In their metamorphosis from fishermen to farmers, the Toraja had an ally who has remained at their side. They honor him with this symbol. white bull of life, the black bull of death. Both demand tribute, the sacrifice of other bulls, as we see here, as a kind of down payment on reincarnation. The Toraja are well aware that without the help of their protector, they would not have the strength and energy to be reborn, reincarnated in a new life. There would not be enough energy to guarantee the survival of individual families. Survival in this case means winning the battle to create new fields. Working like ants for generations, the Toraja have wrested vast areas from the jungle of the plateau 
and created one huge, fertile rice field. On Sulawesi, as on all of Indonesia's tropical islands, rice production knows no seasons. While new shoots are being planted in one section of the paddy, in other sections, growth is already well underway. And in still others, the rice is ripe and being harvested. Rice harvest is common property and will be taken to the village to be stored in collective barns. These small huts are used for temporary storage in case of bad weather. But step by step, trip by trip, the rice will eventually all end up in the collective barns where every family is responsible for its own share, its own reserves. The quantity of these reserves is calculated by an ever-watchful eye. The eye of the queen, custodian of everybody's property and of the community's traditions. Beneath the symbol of her power, the old matriarch, here in the company of a young granddaughter, keeps track of everything and everybody. is the hut where the body of the late king, her husband, rests. When the queen deems that the time has come, the king will be buried over there on the horizon, on the mountain of the dead. In an almost inaccessible place beyond the reach of the jungle, where, with much hardship and at great risk, an entire rock face has been dug out by men determined to give their dead loved ones a safe refuge. the dead, portrayed realistically as if they were still alive. These hollow wooden sculptures contain the ashes of those they represent, and the ashes gathered after their cremation. Subjects waiting for their king. He has not yet reached his final resting place. He is still waiting to be cremated. He lies in his hut, in the middle of a group of empty buildings that are ready to host the guests who will be invited when the time comes to attend the cremation of their sovereign. For the Taraja, he will not be officially dead until the day of his cremation arrives. 
And that will only come to pass when his widow, the queen, makes her decision. The queen has lived in a humble hut ever since she moved out of the royal residence after the death of her husband. She goes to visit him every morning, accompanied like a shadow by her sister. The two women walk through the village while everybody else is at work in the rice paddies. Only one man has remained behind, the court minstrel. Ever since his master died, he has been in hiding as a sign of mourning. His lament seems to come from nowhere as it accompanies the queen on her daily pilgrimage to the man to whom she was married. These visits are not only a question of devotion, duty, or prayer. They have a very precise function. In this hut, where the king lies wrapped in dozens of sarongs, the woman must give the dead sovereign a daily report on life in the community. As far as she is concerned, he is still alive and will continue to live until the day of his cremation. In her daily chronicle, the queen recounts everything that concerns the lives of their people, from insignificant gossip to important news. And the important news today is that another bull is to be sacrificed. Reassuring news for the sovereign. Once again, a strong animal will yield up all its strength to his dead body. A moment of horror that inevitably shocks outsiders. An act of cruelty for those who abhor any kind of violence, be it ritual or not. The watchful eyes of the custodians of local traditions and the bull who is about to be put to death. Accompanied by a shout of pure joy. Subjects of the Taraja king, the blood of the sacrificed bull will prolong their king's life, even though his body is dead, by keeping his spirit alive. body from its blood will come the vital force that will be absorbed by the king's mummified body wrapped in its shroud of innumerable sarongs. From his catafalque, where he lies lifeless in appearance only, the king will now continue to bestow his wisdom on his people until that final moment arrives. It will be the king himself who will make the decision. He will pass it on to the queen, and she will announce to the people that the time has come also for the sovereign to be cremated. into the body of another living entity, be it an animal, a man, a plant, or an invisible spirit. This has always been and always will be the destiny expected by those who believe in reincarnation and the other tenets that for 6,000 years have inspired faith in the followers of Hinduism in all its variations. The black, sacrificial bull, and the white one. A 
complementary duo that clarifies for all believers the concept of life and death and allays the fear of dying. The only acceptable fear is that of a curse or of a misfortune brought upon the villagers and their inhabitants by malignant spirits accidentally summoned up by the power of the sacrificial ceremony. Spirits to be reckoned with because of their great cunning and their destructive powers that are so mysterious and underhand. Such spirits must be exorcised not only in a long and demanding dance carried out by the girls chosen to conclude the sacrificial ceremony, but also in another display of violence, which this time takes the form of indiscriminate kicking. Boys and young men of the village seem to be engaged in a pointless, disorderly combat. But in reality, it is a ritual of exorcism. The expelling from the community of every malevolent, hostile spirit. All this so that the land, the villages, and the sky that host, protect, and feed this small fugitive race in the mountains of Sulawesi may remain free of disaster and never again fear the arrival of violent enemies from distant countries, brought here by sea from the world of the aggressor, to make slaves of a people whose only desire is to live in peace. The Toraja.